two, Urban Targets, a case study in surveillance detection. This is part two. Uh, this week's uh, webinar will tie into some of what you guys learned last week from us when we talked about the attack in Mumbai. Uh, as we are waiting on folks to get on, let's get our contact information knocked out of the way and also stuff coming up. You can get us at michaelmansecurityservices.com. That's our website. Send, them, send us a message through there. You can give us a call, 615-606-1006. That is Scott directly. You can get us at Scott M, S-C-O-T-T-M, at michaelmansecurityservices.com, or you can get me at contact at michaelmansecurityservices.com, or you can always go to Instagram or Facebook. Get us at Safe with Man. Uh, we monitor that unless we're asleep, and so we're pretty quick to respond back if you need to get a hold of us in a hurry for whatever reason. Okay, upcoming events, folks. Uh, these are virtual instructor-led training sessions. So that means from the comfort of your, home, of, of your own home or from your own home, you log on and you get this uh, training. So introduction of vehicle defense, Tuesday, August 11th from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Uh, again, that is uh, going to be on a Zoom platform. We're going to be moving around. That's going to be a busy uh, webinar, so we'll be doing some stuff stationary, and then we're going to be doing stuff in and out of vehicles for you guys to see. Uh, so if you want to learn about the basics of vehicle defense, so we talk about the law, uh, we talk about the use of the vehicle for cover and concealment, uh, we talk about like weapons inside the vehicle, uh, we'll get into a little bit of uh, protecting third parties inside the car. Uh, we're going to do that for two hours, and that's going to be on August the 11th. Go to our uh, uh, website, or you can go to... Uh, um, obviously, on to the Facebook page, you'll see those posted as events, and you can register. Church Protection Specialist Module 1, Security Operations. So uh, we just ran an entire church through all three modules. They spent uh, the entire weekend with me this past weekend. We just had uh, our first uh, group online finish Module 1 and 2. Uh, so they're going to be coming back for Module 3 next month. So we're going to start back over again. This is Module 1. That's on Sunday, August 16th from 1 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Same thing. It is on Zoom, folks. So it's a virtual instructor-led training program or session. If you're a little bit confused about all the programs, this is the Church Protection Specialist, three separate modules. They are a standard for church security team. So it's everything that you need to know is how to stand post, respond to a medical emergency, or when it gets into self-defense and firearms, that's Module 3. So these three modules cover all three of those. You get a lot of neat stuff. You get certificates of completion. Uh, our pins have been ordered, so you're going to get uh, lapel pins from us, and you're also going to get access to a video library uh, that covers all the skills that you learn in this process. All right, so Module 1 starts back over again. Uh, that's going to be August 16th, and again, we'll continue to cover those every month. The second most important uh, class you can probably take, if, especially if you're looking for standards, obviously Church Protection Specialist is the first. The Israeli uh, Security Concept is the second. So this is a two-module uh, series or a series of uh, two modules. Uh, number one is threat identification, so how, how to identify the adversary. Uh, session or module two is field threat assessments, so how to validate what you see. So that uh, threat identification or session one is coming up August uh, 23rd on Sunday, 1 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And again, that is online. You do that from the comfort of your own home or if you're at your church serving, if you got your laptop or your phone with you, uh, jump into a room while you're there at church and you can uh, jump on this and, and join us. All right. We've got uh, people registered for both. So jump in it. We hope to see you there on the 16th or the 11th or the 23rd. All right. So let's get into it. So this kind of picks up where we... Uh, kind of where we dropped off last week, some added stuff for you on surveillance detection. Now, this, this is terrorism, but if you're a church protector, if you're trying to protect your business, all this, uh, this applies to you also. All right, so expectations, about 30 minutes. This will be a quick one. We're going to give some considerations. We're going to talk about a case study in surveillance detection, uh, very specifically an attack that did not happen. Uh, because it was uh, it was detected early uh, based on some uh, arrests and intelligence. We're going to get into uh, uh, the case study itself. We're going to talk about observations, and then I'll uh, uh, open it up for questions and answers. Okay? All right. So considerations to start with, folks, before we get into the case study. Um, there are basic requirements for conducting a successful attack. You guys have heard me say this over and over again. So obviously I'm repetitive about all this and it's because it's important for you guys to know. 
So the basic requirements for that successful attack for the adversary is, number one, this is going to play into what we're going to talk about, the adversary has got to gather information about uh, your target or about your facility that you're trying to protect your person. Number two, they must have the element of surprise. Number three, they must have control. That's why they must have a weapon, an explosive, an edge weapon, a handgun, whatever. So they have to have control of the situation. And number four, they must be mobile. They must be able to move away. And in these cases we're going to talk about today, they got to get to the target area, they got to get in it, they got to conduct the attack, and here they were planning to leave. So they got to be able to be mobile. There is also a series of actions that the, act, that the adversary is going to be required to take against the target. So there's these requirements, which we just went over. So information, surprise, mobility control. Then there are the requirements or these actions that they're going to have to take. And those actions you've heard us talk about, we're going to talk about them here, that adversary attack methodology. And very specifically today, we're going to talk about surveillance or surveillance detection. So what we're looking for when we start to talk about these actions as the protector, you're going to look at those actions that you can detect early. And again, we're going to get into that. So number one, there are basic requirements for the attack. Number two, there's a series of actions. We're going to talk about all this in this case. There are also specific requirements for conducting hostile surveillance. And I'm going to give you that here at the last, but it gets into, number one, I've got to see the target, or the bad guy has to see us or see what we're trying to protect. So they have to show up to look at it. Number two, they have to have a reason to be there just in case they get caught. So they're going to have to have some sort of story or, or something. So if you ask them the question, why it is they're there, they've got an answer for it. And that's what the Israeli security concept gets into. It teaches you how to uh, determine if someone is being deceptive or it helps with that. Um, they also have to have a platform to conduct that surveillance. And I'm going to show you with this case study what that means. So that could be a car, it could be a building, or it could just be the space that they're in. So they have to see it, they have to have a reason to be there, they have to have a platform to conduct that surveillance, and they have to have access to the target. They've got to be able to get into it to look at it to be successful. Okay? Early detection, if you, as you've heard me say, is the key to success. This has been proven to me in my professional life following sexual predators as a police officer and very bad people that rob people and kill people. I've done this when we set these detection programs up for critical infrastructure where we actually caught hostile surveillance from terrorist organizations or people that were working for terrorist organizations right here in the United States of America. We have detected it. We've also been successful in doing this at churches. All right, so we've detected hostile surveillance based on either some sort of criminal activity or something else, and we were actually able to stop that undesirable event. So early detection is the key to success. We do not want to respond. I will say this over and over. I don't care if you're a church, you're a school. Maybe some of you guys jumped on some of our school training that we, we did earlier this week. I said the same thing. Or if you're just a business, the gun does not prevent the attack. I don't care how many guns you have on site, that is not going to stop the attacker. Early detection is what stops. All right. So let's talk about what this is. So our adversary today is Duran Bharat. So Duran Bharat was born in India in 1971. Right? So he moved to the United Kingdom in 1973. Uh, so he was about a year and a half old. So or I, obviously he didn't do this himself. His parents moved to the United Kingdom in 1973. And when he's in his early 20s, he actually converts to Islam. And he travels to Pakistan for training. Now if you tuned in last week, we talked about the Mumbai attack. This is where all this connects. So he actually hooks up with Laskari Taba. Now he is Indian by birth. So if you know or if you realize or if you remember from our studies last week, we talked about that L.E.T., Laskari Taba, Army of the Pure, they are the enemy of India. You know, they're Pakistani, and so they're trying to fight India, and there's a long history there, especially in Kashmir and all, and all the conflict that's going on there for years. So here we have... Uh, someone that, that's Indian by birth, uh, and so his parents moved to the UK when he's very young, and then and when he gets into his 20s, he, conduct, he converts to Islam, and, and the reason for that is because he wants to fight this issue in India. 
this issue between Pakistan and India. So he wants to take this jihadi fight to the country of India. So he does go to uh, lashkar e tabas training camps where he learns about explosives, he learns about firearms, surveillance. We broke down the two different training camps that they have there uh, in Lahore and Pakistan. We talked about that last week. He goes through that training. He actually gets operational uh, experience in Kashmir, so he actually gets on the ground fighting the Indians in a very specific area there in between India and Pakistan. Uh, in some of the other intelligence reports about Duran, um, uh, there is some uh, speculation that he also conducted training. He did training in Afghanistan. So in the, in the late 1990s or somewhere around early 2000, he, he joins with al-Qaeda. Now, if you guys again remember last, last week we talked about the relationship between uh, lashkar e Taiba and al-Qaeda. So 1989 or 1979, 1989, Soviets invade Afghanistan. Uh, there is a fellow by the name of Abdullah Azam who was the mentor uh, for um, Osama bin Laden, religious mentor. Uh, he goes to Afghanistan uh, and he, he kind of creates this global uh, cry out for Muslims to come to Afghanistan, uh, very, very specifically these Mujahideen, these Islamic fighters, to, f to help fight the Soviets. And so out of that, about 1989, out of al-Qaeda, uh, this Pakistani group is born, and uh, they, are, they are the predecessor to lashkar e -Taiba. So we, here we have Duran, uh, Duran Barat, who uh, goes to LET. He's trained. He conducts operations. Then he's training people potentially in Afghanistan later on. He now uh, ends up hooking up or joining up with al-Qaeda, uh, where he actually uh, meets leaders in al-Qaeda and starts to plan this attack. So uh, let me real quick just kind of get into what this attack was. So there were going to be multiple attacks. There were going to be attacks uh, both over in the U.K. and there were going to be attacks in the United States of America. And Barat was the, uh, um, the mastermind of the adversary that actually conducted all the surveillance. So here's why it did not happen. So um, in 2004, there is an arrest of uh, a guy by the name of Muhammad Khan in Lahore, Pakistan. So the Pakistani uh, uh, intelligence agency or organization uh, that, and if you heard me talk about last week, they're kind of connected with LAT. So this, this is all kind of strange how this happened. Uh, but they arrest him in Pakistan. So in Lahore, Pakistan, when they go to arrest him, they go into his residence. Uh, he's, taken, uh, he's taken into custody. Uh, he is, he's actually an al-Qaeda computer engineer, and on his laptop, they find all this information and surveillance for these targets in the U.K. and the United States of America. And so uh, as they start to look at this, this intelligence is turned over uh, to our British authorities, and it's also turned over to authorities in the United States. And this later on leads to the arrest of, of Barat and uh, several other individuals. And so the idea behind this attack was, uh, both in the U.K. and the U.S., there was going to be the use of VBADs, or vehicle-borne uh, improvised explosive devices. They were going to drive these uh, weapons uh, into underground parking garages, and they were going to use these weapons of mass destruction to try to destroy these buildings and kill a large number of people. Okay? I'm going to take you to a video real quick from uh, AP that just uh, kind of quickly, it talks about Barat's uh, arrest and then the plot behind all of this, and then we're going to get actually into the surveillance and what this looks like.
Okay, so let's talk about the targets, the U.S. targets. We're going to get away from the U.K. targets, but let's talk about the U.S. targets, and we're going to talk about the surveillance he conducted uh, in just in plain sight or in plain view. So he's hidden in plain sight. He conducts his, uh, or he's picked the targets out and conducts these observations. So targets. So Prudential Plaza in Newark, New Jersey, uh, the World Bank and the IMF in D.C., uh, New York Stock Exchange in New York City, uh, City Corp Center in New York City, and then several Jewish targets also in New York City. This surveillance, so it wasn't like he showed up and he did this like in two days. This happened through a period of years, so three plus years of conducting hostile surveillance from like 2000 into 2004. So this was long-term surveillance. So what this means is he went to these locations numerous times. In fact, after this came out and they started conducting the investigation when the intelligence was found, what they determined was as they went back and started asking people questions because they figured out what his platform was, where he was conducting the surveillance, they went back and asked people in these areas very specifically, do you remember seeing this guy? And people in the restaurants, on the street that saw him conduct this surveillance for years said, yeah, we know him. He's a great guy. That's the guy with the camera. Man, he's a cool guy. He's really nice. We really like him. He's conducting all this hostile surveillance, this pre-attack surveillance, uh, in plain sight, in plain view with all these people who never even thought about asking the question, why does this guy continue to sit in my restaurant for four hours at a time during the day and draw diagrams and take pictures? And so as they go back, as authorities are going back and asking questions, they figure that that he was seen, he was known, they knew that he was taking pictures, they knew he was conducting surveillance, and no one ever asked a question about it. Okay? So now I'm going to tie this surveillance in into the elements of the requirements for conducting surveillance that we talked about. That seeing the target, we have to have cover and concealment and what access looks like. So how this plays into it, I'm going to plug this in so you can understand this. And, and then I'm going to give you at the end of this uh, some considerations or observations. Okay. So the observation piece of surveillance, and when we talk about those requirements for conducting successful surveillance. So the observations. So these targets, they were out in the open. So anybody can see them. So very, very easy for the surveillance. These targets are out in the open. They're in a busy place, so he could see the targets anyway. Now, they were surrounded by surveillance platforms. What that means, because there's businesses and other buildings and locations around the targets, he was able to set up in these platforms to conduct surveillance. So restaurants, other businesses for long periods of time. So he's, uh, again, that first element is I need to see the target or the bad guy needs to see it. They were in plain view, number one, or they were out in the open. And number two, there were platforms all around where he could observe. He actually used cameras, sketches, notes. All this was done as he was observing the target. All of this is, is done while he's surveillance is hiding in plain sight. And the reason why we call it hiding in plain sight is the majority of people can, to, can conduct surveillance in front of a normal person or thousands of people, and those people will never know, ex it won't have an idea of what that adversary is doing. So when we talk about that first requirement, surveillance, the targets were out in the open for Barat. Uh, he was surrounded by surveillance platforms that he actually used. He was able to use those cameras, those sketches, take those notes, and no one ever asked him any questions because he's out in the open. And, uh, again, he was hiding in plain sight. I'll show you how just obvious this should have been, and it was not. This is a, uh, an, an older uh, newscast from ABC. It takes a few minutes. This is actual footage of him conducting surveillance of these targets in New York City and in Newark. There is no sound to most of this. All right. So there is no sound. If you can, uh, guys, there's no sound to this. Or I think some comes up in the middle of this. So what you're seeing is he's walking around New York City. He's in the financial district, and he's actually just walking around with a video camera. At some point before this ends, I think you're going to see some police officers, emergency responders. That's what you're going to see is he's actually video in the locations of the emergency responders. So the plan here was to take these V-beds, put them in the bottom of these locations, and blow up the buildings. And the plan was for these terrorists to, to actually escape. So we talk about that adversary attack methodology, escape could be the last. So you can also see he's taking photos or videos of, uh, of CCTV locations. And so he's walking around, and he did this for over three years, over and over again. The detail of surveillance was absolutely amazing, according to the reports. 
And so you can see he's taking, uh, again, uh, footage of where all the CCTVs are, where the entrances are, and, of course, then some cat sound's going to come into it now. So he's doing this pre-9-11 uh, post pre and post-9-11. So a lot of what you see now was done after 9-11, okay? So you can see he's looking at maps. This is actually escape routes for them to get out the terrorist after the attack. So he's, he's looking at the maps so he can tell them escape routes so they can escape after they've conducted the attack. CCTV again, all the locations for CCTV. Really what he's doing here, again, he's just gathering that intelligence. More CCTV. The location. The entrances, how to get in and out, what kind of entrances and exits are used, and is there CCTV or security footage. So, he, And he's also taking uh, photos there, videos of the barricades that are set up. Police officers, police presence. What's the police presence looks like? There's just a police officer sitting there in his vehicle. So he's uh, this surveillance is uh, determining who, when we start talking about terrain analysis, Number one, what can they see, but also who is going to stop them? What's the police presence look like of the law enforcement presence around these targets? So who's going to be a barrier to get into my way? He's showing, that, showing them that to get in, they have to have identification check. Again, a lot of this is post 9-11, just right after. Street signs. The reason he's taking the pictures of the street signs is so they know which way to go and which way they can't go. Again, escape routes. Avenues of approach and avenues or ways to get out of the target area to escape to get away after the, attack, the attack's conducted. Again, some of this is pre-9-11. Some of it's post-9-11. Okay, so just some of the video, a couple minutes of that. There's about six minutes of that, what they actually released on the news. So when we start talking about observation, this for three and a half years, he's walking around in New York. He's in Newark, New Jersey. He's in D.C. walking around with these cameras doing this in, just in plain view, right? Now, you may ask, well, you know, he looks like a tourist. Absolutely. But the people are seeing this guy over and over again in different locations, sitting in places in platforms, surveillance platforms, and taking notes and taking pictures. So when you see this over and over, and so you see time and you see different environments with the same person, things to start thinking about something's not right, so it's something to be reported. And uh, in the investigation phase of this, as they're trying to gather information to convict him once he was arrested, they go back and talk to these people in these locations. That's how they kind of found out outside of the intel that they got off of the laptop where he was conducting the surveillance. People were coming up and saying, yeah, I know that guy. He's great. He's a good dude. Yeah, he sat here for a long time. We'd serve him coffee. We'd give him food. He was great. Really, really nice guy. Um, so... 2000, 2004 again, so cover concealment. Here's how he did it. Here's the method, his story, and how, what kind of platforms he used and how he did it. So 2000, 2004 travels from the UK to US numerous times using a student visa. So he actually applied to New York, to a New York area college in June of 2000, but there's no record or registration of, of him attending. So he's got a, a student visa where he's kind of going back and forth uh, to be able to come into the country to use that as a cover. Conducted the majority of surveillance against the Prudential Plaza there in Newark from a coffee shop lo located right across the street. This is going on for like two and a half to three years. He was never questioned. While he's in this coffee shop, he's drawing maps, he's taking pictures, he's drawing diagrams. He's actually writing notes about the security personnel at the location while he's inside this coffee shop. Um, he's also getting the exact location of the garage that's underneath the plaza because that's where they want to uh, drive the V-beds into. He's also getting timing of traffic lights and avenues of approach so he can tell uh, the operators of the terrorists how they can get out. So he's kind of, he's, he's drawing this attack plan up. 
So that's the cover and concealment part for the Prudential, Pl uh, Prudential Plaza. Uh, the cover and concealment for City Corps. Same thing, surveilled and mapped the best locations to plant IEDs. So they were actually also not only going to drive into these places, but plant IEDs so pedestrians would also um, potentially be victims of IEDs that were planted. He also kept track of the heaviest pedestrian flow around the buildings. Again, hiding in plain sight, doing all this with a camera and a notepad over and over again. Uh, New York Stock Exchange, uh, heavy foot surveillance around the building itself. He even identified detailed escape routes for the adversaries uh, at the New York Stock Exchange. So we talk about observation. We talk about cover concealment. Uh, those are the first two elements for that uh, conducting su uh, successful uh, surveillance. When we talk about access, he actually had access at least into the lobby of the World Bank. So when he got into the access to the main entrance uh, to that area, he gave a detailed description of the security desk, uh, the security uniforms that the guards were wearing or the coats. He gave descriptions of the barriers or the turnstiles, and he also gave uh, a number of security, the number of security personnel that were actually inside that World Bank. So he's going to be feeding this information into these target folders or these, or these attack folders that were going to go back to Al Qaeda. So a lot of information about surveillance. So some things to think about when you look at this case study, how it ties back into LET, who we talked about last week, and what those requirements for surveillance are and how this ties into it. Again, this is a quick one. We want to do this in 30 minutes. So some things to think about are what to look for. So understand there are some objectives for surveillance, very specifically hostile surveillance. So we would use these as indicators. So number one, always remember when the adversary is conducting surveillance, they're doing a target assessment. And they want to know a couple things. Number one, are you a hard or soft target? And that has nothing to do with guns. It doesn't have to do with fences. What this has to do with is, is the adversary, he's asking himself, can we be detected? Is someone going to see us early, uh, number one, so are we going to be observed? And number two, what's going to stop us here? And what they mean by what's going to stop what they're looking for is who's going to ask them that question? Who's going to practice a questioning attitude? And who's going to discover their plans early? So when we start talking about soft targets, we talk about defense. That's what we're talking about. If guns actually stop violence, we wouldn't have school shooters, right? We wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't have shooters in courthouses where there are police officers with guns. We're, you're seeing attacks on police headquarters now. So if guns actually prevented violence, then we wouldn't have these attacks. So they're looking to see, number one, what they can see, who can see them, and what barrier system is going to, or what, who's going to stop them, which means who's going to see them early, who's going to discover them, and who's going to stop them before they can actually conduct the attack. Number two, they're trying to identify system weaknesses. What are the site's vulnerabilities? You saw some of the vulnerabilities. Uh, bad barrier systems up around the buildings. Uh, CCTV might, maybe not being monitored. Uh, you saw uh, a police presence or police officers maybe not paying attention, or maybe it's not a big police presence. Some of the other vulnerabilities you saw, some of those sites, this guy's walking around with a camera for two and a half to three years. No one ever stopped and asked him a question. Why are you here all the time videoing these buildings? No one ever stopped and asked that question. He was friendly to everybody. Everybody liked him, and so he fit into the environment. Determine security measures. Again, what is it going to take to get in? When we talk about the World Bank, he very specifically in these detailed reports said, look, this is what the desk looks like. This is where it's located. The people sitting at the desk, they are obviously security personnel. They have radios. To get past the desk and to get into the space, there are turnstiles. You have to have a badge to be able to do that. So he's given very specific information on the security measures. So again, that surveillance, and again, you saw it here. Number one, target assessment. Is it a soft target or hard target? What's the target value? Target pattern analysis. When is it open? Who's inside? Uh, where's that target area, where we're going to have to get to, or where's, where are our operators or our trackers going to get to. Identify the system weaknesses, what's as access look like, how hard is it going to be to get into the building. Are they, do they even see me? Do they even think there's a problem when I'm here conducting the surveillance? And the, qu and the answer here was no. And then, of course, those security measures, are there guards? What are the physical security bar barriers? How do I get through those barriers? What does that mean? And how do I have to, what's more important, how does the adversary have to get around those barriers to be able to be successful? Physical security design features, folks, concentric rings of protection. I continue to say this. I don't care if you're a church. I don't care what kind of business you are. You must have concentric rings. And I will tell you, a camera or a drone is only a supplement to the human element. So you must have a layered approach 
to your building, to your school, and to your church. And nothing beats the human element. Yes, we're broken. Yes, we get tired. Yes, we get hungry. But nothing beats that person on the ground, especially if you have a surveillance detection program and they know what they're looking for. So concentric rings, number one. And number two, of course, that physical protection system, that uh, deterrence, which is going to be created, hopefully, by that, those concentric rings, uh, that early detection, and then, of course, that delay in that response is always last. Validation and reporting, we've talked about this before. You must be able, that's what we teach in the Israeli security concept, and we teach this in church protection special certification courses, folks. You must be able to, number one, not only identify that that might be surveillance, but you have to validate that through a process. So you have to know what the norm in your environment is. You have to understand the adversary and understand what those attack processes or methodologies look like. You must also be able to have to separate what may be an adversary and what's not going to be an adversary. There's a process for that. And then after you determine all that, you must be able to go up and when we, talk, when we uh, start talking about those behavioral and contextual indicators, you need to know what questions to ask and what kind of feedback you should be receiving to understand uh, whether or not this is a potential adversary or this is just a false alarm. And that reporting has to go into some kind of reporting system or that information. And this is where your suspicious activity reports come into play. And again, folks, this is what we're teaching these other classes join these classes they're inexpensive they're cheap it's three and a half to four hours and it's a fraction of the cost of what you're going to pay of these other uh, of these other training sessions okay all right uh q a real quick that was a quick one we promised 30 minutes we're at 434 we started at five minutes after scott any questions all right folks hey uh what 16th is church protection specialist right August the 16th, Church Protection Specialist. Go to our event, our Eventbrite, or go to our uh, MichaelManSecurityService.com, our website. You can register from there. Uh, the 23rd is the Israeli Security Concept. Is that correct? 23rd is the Israeli Security Concept, uh, um, Module 1, Threat Identification. If you want to know about how to do all the stuff that I keep spitting out every week, that's where you go to. CPS is 75 bucks. Uh, Israeli Security Concept is 60 bucks. 60 bucks per module. You can't beat it. All right, hey, Scott, put the links below in the comments. So register. We've got people in the classes. Jump in them now. You're going to meet people from all over the country. Something we're about to announce, something we're, we're very happy about, Nigeria is coming to Michael Mann Security Services in November. And if you're on, thank you so much. Bless you for doing this for us. We are going to be providing security training for, for Nigeria in November, that's going to be a virtual-led training session. We are going to Nigeria sometime in the spring to teach behavioral threat detection. So our plan long-term in the spring is after this session in November, we're going to, be going to uh, go to Nigeria, and we're going to teach those uh, uh, after we teach these basic church protection uh, modules to or just a session to uh, our brothers and sisters in Nigeria we are planning to go to Nigeria in the spring, and we're going to be teaching some more advanced stuff. So, Anne, if you're on with us, uh, she's in Nigeria. Thank you so much. God bless you. We appreciate everything that you did to help us spin this up. All right, folks, we hope you got something out of this. Uh, join us next week. We're going to have an air, another a very interesting webinar. We'll put that out here shortly. So if you're following us on Eventbrite, you'll get that notification. Uh, thanks again for joining us. If you're a church protector, be careful as the churches start coming back. Some bad things have been happening here lately with the churches. So, uh, so just be on the lookout. Stay in condition yellow. Hopefully you don't have to go into condition orange. And we hope to see you on some of these uh, virtual-led instructor sessions. And remember, folks, 